so we're going to start the uh, uh, afternoon session. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Alberto Delfia. Uh, he's coming uh, more from, uh, let's say, the integer programming uh, optimization community. Uh, and he's going to uh, tell us about uh, short simplex paths in lattice quantums. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, to the organizers uh, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. So yes, I'm going to talk about some simplex algorithm in lattice polytopes. And so uh, let me uh, tell you what I exactly mean with a lattice polytope. Uh, well, of course, I mean uh, a, a polytope with uh, all integral vertices. But in this talk, I'm always going to focus on uh, polytopes containing a box. So in a box which has the same size in each uh, dimension, so it's exactly 0k to the n. And throughout the talk, I will always use n for the dimension of the space where we live uh, and k for the size of this box. Uh, of course, uh, integer, I mean, lattice polytopes appear uh, throughout uh, several fields in polyhedral combinatorics. Uh, think about uh, the, uh, the convex hull of any set of characteristic vectors of a ground set. Uh, these are all 0, 1 uh, polytopes. Uh, uh, in integer programming, uh, the convex hull uh, of the integer points uh, in uh, a rational polyhedron is always an integer uh, a lattice polytope. Uh, and also in fractional relaxations in, uh, of combinatorial optimization problem, we have uh, uh, polytopes which are equivalent, essentially. Think about uh, the fractional um, matching polytope, for example. That's a, uh, that's a polytope which is fractional, contained in the 0, 1 cube, but the vertices are 0, 1, up 1. So up to scaling, we can transform it to a lattice polytope uh, with k equal to 2. Good. So um, there's been a, a very interesting stream of research regarding uh, uh, the diameter of lattice polytope. Uh, so uh, it started with Nadef in 1989, who gave uh, an upper bound of uh, n for the case k equal to 1. And this is, uh, this is f yes remind people what diameter you mean. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm talking about the combinatorial diameter, so which is uh, the um, um, longest uh, path along the edges uh, of the polytopes between uh, any two uh, vertices. Thank you. Um, good. So the first result, then, um, that I'm aware of is the upper bound uh, of uh, n given by Nadef in the case k equal to 1, which is uh, especially nice because it's uh, tight, um, for example, even the hypercube already attains that. Uh, then uh, a few years later, Klein, Schmidt, and Don uh, extended this result uh, to uh, general uh, lattice polytopes, uh, giving an upper bound of k times n. Then uh, uh, some years ago, we obtained this improved upper bound for the case k greater than or equal to 2. And this upper bound uh, is uh, tight for k equal to 2 in any dimension. And a few years later, in 2018, uh, uh, Design Purin uh, gave uh, a better bound uh, for k greater than or equal to 3. Um, in any case, I mean, uh, note that this, uh, this, uh, this uh, improvements on the upper bound uh, kn by Klein, Schmidt, and Don still are essentially linear in k and in n. Uh, good. So uh, what about lower bounds? So worst case uh, diameters over lattice polytopes. As I already mentioned, some of the previous results were tight. Therefore, here I have an n for k equal to 1 and a 3 half n for k equal to 2. Uh, then, for think about this result for a fixed k. Here it's, it's telling us that for any fixed k, for n large enough, uh, we have uh, um, that the lower bound, that worst case uh, diameter can grow essentially linearly with n. And uh, uh, what about these other two results instead? Uh, from what we're interested in, uh, they, they somewhat talk about the opposite direction, so fix uh, an n. Then how do, do these lower bounds grow? Well, for n equal to 2, uh, Balog and Barani show that uh, this, uh, low this worst case diameter grows as k to the 2 thirds uh, as k goes to infinity. And similarly, for n fixed, uh, the Zap, Ren, and Sukegawa show that, that it grows essentially like uh, k to the n over n plus 1, so almost linear in uh, k. So a lot of interesting results, and there's uh, still much to do uh, regarding the diameter of lattice polytopes. But the takeaway uh, uh, from these two slides that, uh, that I care about in this talk is that essentially both lower and upper bounds uh, are uh, linear in k and n. Okay? And, um, uh, so that's very important to me, to, to, to this talk. And also what is very important is that all these bounds 
are in terms of these two parameters, which are n and k, which somewhat tells us that uh, they are a good choice when you want to study the diameter of lattice polytopes as opposed to the general case of polyhedra or polytopes uh, where you normally look at n and m, which is the number of inequalities. Essentially, all these results uh, uh, don't care at all about the number of inequalities. Good. So we're not going to be talking about diameter. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, linear programming. So what I'm interested in is this problem. So we have uh, our, uh, our feasible region is uh, exactly a lattice polytope as we discussed so far, and it's given to us by an external description of the form ax less than or equal to b, and I'm assuming with our local generality that everything is integral. And also I'm given an objective function to be maximized uh, over p. Good, um, so what we want to do is uh, obtain a simplex algorithm that uh, given any um, starting vertex, arrives uh, to, of course, an optimal vertex, vertex x star, and being it a simplex algorithm, is going to trace exactly a path along the edges of the polytope. And uh, the question is, can we design such an algorithm uh, that traces uh, a path which is not too far from the diameter, essentially? So possibly our target would be that we are polynomially far from the worst case diameter. And we just saw that this diameter grows essentially linearly in n and k, so what we want as our first target is a, a simplex path length, which is polynomial in n and k alone, in particular independent on, on all the data and independent on the number of inequalities. Um, so let me just take a second to also uh, give a little bit of an insight on how the proofs are different when you talk about diameter and when you talk about instead uh, a simplex algorithm. Well, of course, uh, well, this is, a, this is of course a, 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 an, an algorithmic uh, proof, so it's very different. You need to give an algorithm. But in general, even more importantly, I think that when you look at the diameter, you pick two, any two uh, vertices of your polyhedron, of your polytope, and you, if you want to give a constructive proof, construct such a path using the information of both vertices. Here instead, it's very different because you have only one given vertex, your initial vertex, and you don't know what the optimal one will be. So uh, it's much more difficult because you have to construct this path only starting from one side and eventually reach the optimal point. Good, so there are many interesting results uh, in the literature that talk about short simplex paths uh, in uh, lattice polytopes. Uh, and uh, most of them are for very specific uh, uh, lattice polytopes uh, com corresponding to combinatorial optimization problem. Um, but what I the result I really want to talk about here is a, re a recent result by Kitahara, Matsui, and Mizuno uh, that is uh, very general and also can be um, used in our setting. So. What they do, I mean, is the result is a bit different, but it's stated for our purposes here. So they take a lattice polytope like ours, but in standard form. So that's the main difference, actually the only difference. And they show that they can construct, uh, um, that actually the Danzig original uh, simplex rule gives uh, a path whose length is uh, this guy over here. Uh, well, so I'm not really, uh, we don't really need to fully understand this. I mean, it's a function of uh, n, m, number of inequalities, k, uh, and that's it. But what is interesting is that we can use it in our setting. So pick our general form, lattice polytope, uh, just uh, add uh, our slack variables. In this way, uh, we still obtain uh, a lattice polytope. That's great. We still obtain, uh, so, and the new polytope has the same adjacency structure to the original one. So great for, for, for our purposes. But what changes though is the size of the box because now we have to take into account how large the slugs can be. Uh, so the box uh, is inflated uh, because it can become as large as S uh, where S is this max uh, of the slugs essentially. And so in any case, if we apply these results, we obtain a simplex path length bounded by uh, this number over here. And you see we're somewhat close to what we want. It's a function, uh, it's a polynomial in n, k, but it just so happens that we have this s that we want to get rid of, okay? So that's what we, in this case, want to get rid of. And we will see that we managed to do this, but through a completely different approach. Good. So uh, 
this brings me immediately to the first results that we have, uh, and I, I will tell you more uh, later, but I just want to give you the results. We are able to give a simplex algorithm uh, that reaches uh, a simplex path length uh, of n to the fourth k log n k, which therefore is good because it's polynomially far from uh, our target, uh, essentially n k. And in particular, it, I, I stress again that it's independent on the cost vector c, on the description of p, and the number of inequalities. Um, uh, good, I already said that. So the next question that we had is, uh, well, in fact, most lattice polytopes uh, that, uh, for which I know we have uh, a, an explicit description from combinatorial optimization problems are defined via zero plus one minus, plus minus one constraint matrices. So essentially, if you look through uh, Scriver's uh, combinatorial optimization books, uh, all the combinatorial polytopes uh, we're aware of uh, uh, and we have a full description have coefficients in zero plus minus one. So I, we thought, well, can we improve this bound uh, for such polytopes? Um, and in fact, yes, we are, we are able to do that and we do it a little bit more generally by introducing a parameter alpha that is exactly the largest absolute value of any entry in the constraint matrix uh, defining the polytope. So in this setting, we're able to uh, replace n to the fourth that we had here with n square, uh, and the price we have to pay is to have an alpha appear inside inside the log. And um, um, and this, I mean, is not a such a big price to pay, I think, because if you think about it, if alpha is any polynomial in n and k, then essentially alpha disappears from that length. Uh, and uh, if we get back to my motivation, which was uh, uh, k equal to one, so for combinatorial uh, zero one polytopes, then we reach uh, just uh, a simplex path uh, of this length uh, and square log n. Actually, yes, like alpha most, like something like uh, n k to the n kind of. Yes, yes, you can. So, so wouldn't that give you uh, like an n cubed, like a. I think I think you would get, yeah, a larger. I think. You, you if you you mean if you just substitute the general yeah, alpha. Yeah. Do you get like, because I'm just wondering why you wouldn't do that because you have an n to the fourth in your other alpha. <coughs> if you do that, as far as if I didn't make any mistake, you would obtain more than n to the fourth here, like n to the five or n to the six. Okay. Yeah. Okay. With facet complexity and. Yeah. Vertex yeah. complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good, so how does it work? So uh, all the algorithms that I'm gonna be talking about are based on this oracle, like the simplest oracle you can think of in these settings, which allows us to forget about uh, the degeneracy, you know, the degeneracy which often play uh, a kind of a role in this type of results. So I'm just gonna call this oracle a bunch of times. So we're given a poly, so it takes an input a, a polytope, an objective vector, and the current vertex of P, and it, either gives me in output a better adjacent vertex, which will serve as the next step in my path, or it just tells me that my vertex uh, is actually optimal for the problem. Um, good. Uh, and this can be, I mean, if you were, I'm not really gonna talk about uh, the runtime, but this can be done in polytime in the size of the constraint matrix. Um, good, uh, what else? Um, note that essentially all our algorithms are based on this oracle, which also breaks arbitrarily ties, right? Think about it, we don't really have a specific pivoting rule that picks uh, uh, an adjacent vertex uh, over another one in a specific way. Everything is gonna work for this very general oracle. So that's my to-do list, that's what I'm gonna talk about. First, I'm gonna give you a trivial algorithm, what you would just uh, try for um, directly by using the oracle in the most straightforward way, and we will obtain a length of kn infinity norm of c, then we see that with the bit scaling approach, we can reduce the dependency on c uh, to the log, and then using a preprocessing step, we can completely get rid of the log, so completely get rid of c, and so that's how we obtain the first result. And then later on, we're gonna instead uh, describe a, um, much more involved iterative algorithm, uh, which is the one that brings alpha uh, into the picture. So let's see the basic algorithm. So what everything it does, so what's the input? 
our lattice polytope, uh, objective vector, and any current given vertex. And it, we have to return uh, an optimal vertex of P. And so what do we do? We just uh, iteratively call the oracle over and over again with the same polytope, of course our polytope, the same objective function, and we only update the, the vertex uh, that we give in input because it's gonna be the output of the previous iteration. So really the most simple thing you can do. And um, in this case, uh, you can easily see, and we all know this, is that the length that we obtain is upper bounded by uh, C transpose X star minus X zero, uh, because everything is integer, right? C is integer, and X star and X zero are integer. And so essentially, we're just looking at the number of uh, um, level sets containing integer points between the two points. Like in this case, it's two. In this case, it's uh, five, maybe. Uh, and if you want, of course, uh, a bound that doesn't depend on the two vertices, then you just have Kn infinity norm of C, which is exactly the lattice width of the full uh, cube in that direction. Great. So let's see if we can do something a little bit better than that. So our first uh, improvement is uh, uh, our scaling algorithm. And so we're going to use a bit scaling technique. These techniques uh, are not new. They are uh, the first time I think I, I've seen them are in papers in the 70s and they've been applied many, many times to solve, to give polynomial time algorithms, especially to combinatorial optimization problems. So what we're doing here is we construct uh, a bunch so log uh, infinity norm of C approximations of our vector C. So better and better approximations. Each approximation uh, has infinity norm at most two to the T. So here's an example. The f uh, that's my target vector. C zero will have uh, at most uh, one in the entries and that's the best we can do. Uh, that's the definition really, if you wanna look at that. Uh, C1, then we're allowed to have also twos, then threes and fours until we are able to have uh, until eight, which we, uh, means uh, that we, ca we can write exactly C. So essentially, yes, it's the best always. So every CI is the best approximation of C with uh, such constraint, pretty much. Good, so how are we gonna use this uh, scaling technique? Uh, well, we're gonna call now our basic algorithm recursively with the same polytope that never changes. But now at every iteration, we, we give a better approximation of uh, the target vector. And uh, the vertex that we give is the one obtained in the previous iteration. So for example, here, let's say this is my x0, that's my x star that I don't know. And these are my level sets. So well, intuitively you see the level sets are many from here to x star, but in the first approximation, my C0 is just one, one, the level sets are uh, few because it's a rough approximation. And so uh, what I do in the scaling algorithm, I go from X0 to the best point for this objective function, which is X1. Now from X1, I update my uh, objective and I use one, two, it's the next best approximation. And it just so happens that I'm still optimal, I'm already optimal at uh, x1, which is therefore equal to x2. And then finally from here, I use my next approximation, which equals my t, and which brings me to the true optimum. So here, the key step, of course, is in using uh, the vertex in input from the previous iteration, because this exactly allows us to show that now the length uh, is bounded by kn uh, log of c infinity. Good. Um, okay, so now the next step was to completely get rid uh, on uh, uh, C. Why yeah. does that work? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, because essentially what you show is that at the previous iteration, uh, since you were op uh, optimizing a similar function, uh, you covered most uh, of the, um, the space, yeah, well, from x uh, from uh, x zero to that point, and so yeah, it's a really it's a simple algebraic derivation, really. Okay. Yeah, I can show you later. Yeah. Um, good. So, uh, how do we get rid of uh, C? Well, in we're gonna use a preprocessing algorithm. So the idea here is the following: I'm gonna just replace in my scaling algorithm 
my original objective function with a shorter one? Well, of course, we, we know it's easy to see that there always exists a shorter one. The question is how to derive it uh, in equally time. And here we're gonna use uh, uh, out of the box uh, this algorithm uh, due to Frank and Tardos uh, in 1987, uh, which relies on simultaneous approximation uh, uh, algorithm by Lenstrand, Lenstrand, Lovash. Uh, so that's what it does. Um, pick our input, uh, yeah, it has an input vector. In general, it tends to be a rational vector. For us, it will be integer. And it has a positive integer n in input, which somewhat controls the size of uh, the output. Uh, the output is uh, a shorter vector, uh, which for us will be equivalent to C for our purposes, with the right choice of capital N. And so we have this brief C integral such that first it's short, whatever this uh, this number is uh, is short for me. <laughs> uh, it depends, of course, of, on capital N. And more importantly, well, as importantly, the sign of C transpose Z is equal to the sign of brief C transpose Z for every integral Z of one norm bounded by n. Good, so how are we gonna use that? Well, we're gonna use that with uh, capital N equal kn plus one. And so in this way, we can immediately see that x star is optimal for C brief, uh, if and only if really, it's optimal for C. Why? Well, you just need to look at z, so our z here is essentially x star minus x for every feasible point x. So x star is the optimum, so it's integer. x is any integer point in our box, uh, or in p, or any vertex of p, whatever. And so, of course, since we both are in the box, uh, their one norm is bounded by kn, so we can directly apply these results. And the sign, so essentially, uh, x star, so the sign of this guy is equal to the sign of this guy, so x star is optimal for one objective if and only if it's optimal for the other objective. Great, so at this point you just have to uh, merge together these two algorithms, just use my previous scaling algorithm with this pro processing step at the beginning and then call the scaling algorithm and you directly obtain uh, this upper bound on the length. Good, and so uh, we're done with our first result. Uh, what about the second? The second is a bit more involved. Uh, we want to now use alpha, right? Alpha, which was defined as the largest absolute values of the entries in my constraint matrix. Uh, the trick here is the following. Um, at every, so we're gonna have an iterative algorithm, which at every iteration will uh, identify one new constraint of the system defining P, which is optimal at, sorry, which is satisfied uh, at equality by every optimal solution to of my problem. So in this way, at every iteration, I can decrease the dimension of my problem by one, essentially. These types of algorithms are nothing new. I mean, uh, there are several types of uh, re uh, algorithms for different, especially combinatorial optimization problems that do something like this. The question is, uh, can you do something like this? Of course, it's one of the first uh, ideas that come to your mind. And uh, for us, it works also. I mean, one of the reasons why it's a very natural idea is that every face of a lattice polytope is a lattice polytope, of course, in the same box. And uh, for example, uh, a very good uh, description of an algorithm that does something similar is given by Tardos in our uh, uh, um, algorithm for combinatorial problems. Note that most of these algorithms are not simplex-like, right? In our case, we want to a simplex-like algorithm, so we want to construct such a simplex path. Good, so here's our algorithm. Uh, okay, let's uh, walk through it uh, step by step. Input and output are always the same. We saw them already. Here in our initialization step zero, we have a set E that simply is the set of uh, inequalities uh, that are set to equality at that specific iteration. So these are the inequalities that if you set them to equality, you identify the phase that you're working on on this specific iteration. And uh, X star just means, is, well, is the current vertex we are at. So what we do here, the first step uh, is uh, um, we just project C onto the affine hull of the face uh, that we're currently working on. So of course then, uh, C and C bar optimizing either of them over the face is the same. So no big deal here. It's kind of technical in a sense why we have to do this. 
Um, next, we construct an approximation of uh, C bar. How do we do that? We essentially scale C bar so that it has infinity norm and cube K alpha and then round down. Good. Now we consider the following primal problem. So a new linear programming problem. It's essentially the problem we should be solving at this iteration. So the, the feasible region is exactly our polyhedron with the specific inequalities of the phase at equality. So this is exactly the phase we should be looking at. What's different though is that we're not looking at C or C bar, which would give me exactly the problem I'm interested in, if of course I did the fixing in a correct way, uh, but it's the approximation we just had uh, defined. And then we look at the dual. Now from these two problems, I'm gonna derive two different things. From the primal, I'm going to obtain a piece of the simplex path. How I start from my current vertex, x star, and I just apply the scaling algorithm to this guy. So I'm, I'm gonna compute a simplex path to its optimum. And uh, this will work nicely for me because x tilde has a controlled uh, infinity norm, okay? Good. Uh, then, what do I use the dual for? I use it to identify what is the next inequality to set to equality for the next iteration. Good, so uh, that's exactly what we do. So uh, for the primal I told you, uh, for the dual I compute an optimal solution to the dual that satisfies a couple of technical assumptions that I don't wanna talk about right now. In any case, then I define the, the indices for which y tilde i is larger than nk, and of course we have to show there is at least one, and we pick one of it and add it to our set of inequalities uh, that, uh, that we have to set to equality. And that's it, and I return back to step one. Okay, so of course it's very mysterious at this point, we have to prove uh, several things. So first, uh, we have to show the vector x star is optimal indeed, then the simplex path length, and finally, I've never talked again about runtime, but essentially we can show that um, to construct the next uh, uh, vertex uh, in the simplex path, that's uh, how much work you have to do, uh, which uh, simplifies to this number if you have a faster description with uh, a nice description of the polygon. So anyway, in just the last minute, I wanna give you a little bit of the idea of uh, why this uh, everything works. Uh, so here's the thing. These are my prima and dual that I had in the statement of the algorithm. And at every iteration, we focus on a specific phase uh, uh, defined uh, by the set E. Uh, and we have to prove that every optimal solution to the problem lies in F. That's the key thing to prove. Now, let me define C hat uh, as the scaling of C bar before I took the floor to define C tilde, okay? These two vectors are very similar, right? Because one is just the uh, floor of the other. Now, if so what I would really like to look at is uh, at this problem with the C hat, because this is the true problem I have to solve. The problem is that now this problem is no longer the dual to this, right? They're no longer a primal dual, but they're almost primal and dual, right? Because C hat is uh, very close to C tilde, so they're nearly primal and dual. Now, if they were primal and dual, then I could argue that if in an optimal solution, I have a positive yi, then I can set the inequality, the corresponding inequality of the primal to equality for every optimal solution. That's as complementary as Lachness. But of course I can't because they're not primal and dual. However, they're almost primal and dual and this essentially allows us to show that if the dual variable at optimality is large enough, so larger than nk, then actually you can argue the same thing about the almost primal. And that's it. This is really the main trick of the proof. Now at this point, at, at each iteration, we know that the length uh, of the path, this, this piece of the path constructed at each, each iteration is, uh, um, uh, is this guy over here. Okay, you can compute it because of the upper bound on 
the length of C tilde, and we have in total n, n iterations, so we just have to multiply this guy by n, and that's our total length that we obtained. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. that you're in a box, that your vertices are in a box to help you in the last algorithm? Oh, you, we use it several times. Yeah, actually uh, several times throughout the proof. Um, uh, yeah, I can tell you. Yeah, I think this is a bit technical, so I can tell you a bit later, but uh, it's heavily used. Okay. Yeah. I believe. All right. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.